Live. We did it. Hello. <laughs> <Whew. laughs> mm. All right. So so crazy so good. Once. Yeah, how's everybody going? How's the doom scrolling going this week? I I, I believe <laughs> what I said to Pamela this morning was what a week, and she said it's Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah, my dooms. I've, I've, I think I've I may have actually found the bottom of the a, scroll of a, doom. You found that you got to the bottom of it. You found out the answer. Yep. Yeah, that's when the browser crashes and everything goes away, and you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. When you actually take your computer offline. I pretty much start every morning. I wake up and uh, and I open Twitter on my phone. First thing I do, this is why I'm always rage tweeting at seven in the morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually I scroll until it actually ends. You get the little dot at the end. It's like you've seen all the tweets. <laughs> so then you refresh and there's a whole bunch more. And, you know, yeah. you just keep to going. make you angry. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, for all that I'm a social media person, I don't doom scroll. I just basically get off Twitter as soon as I'm done doing work stuff and run away. Yeah. That's, healthy. That, that's it's super healthy. That that's, that's really good, Beth. You're a, you're a, I, I think it's because I've worked in it for so all. long. <clears throat> I think it's because I've worked in it for so long that even that, you know, it's my job. So you don't want to do your job when you're not working. I installed the Twitter app on my phone, which is like one of my red lines. Like I do not install <laughs> the Twitter no. app on my phone. It is not done. Yeah. We broke Frasier. The world has broken Frasier. Yeah, I know. I know. For the longest time, Pam was like, how come you never use Twitter? I'm like, I don't know. It's stupid. And then, uh, <laughs> and, and then I'm like, fine, years. I'll post stuff to Twitter. Yeah, years. For years he said that. Yeah. And then, well, uh, basically, Frasier uses Twitter in, in the way of, I'm going to program a whole bunch of stuff, just automatically post, and then walk away. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The The... It's, it's Sounds even like a more good option fiend, to me. It's, it's even a little more fiendish than that, actually, which is that I'm I'm communicating to the writers stories that they can write if they want. So the list of stories that that the writers are able to pick from are right. first run through my Twitter feed, and then that <laughs> gives them sort of all the information that they need to be able to decide to do a story. So you'll often see my original story on on Twitter. 
you'll see the original source like to a journal or to a to a press release or a you know something like that and then a day later you'll see a, another tweet but now it's the actual article on universe today with the exact same title and the exact same picture so um yeah i don't actually but but i am actually reading twitter and i don't like it <laughs> it, it started it started at the beginning of 2020 and it has continued on and i keep un uninstalling twitter and uh just using the browser version because it's like more of a pain and then mm -hmm. i'm like this is too much of a pain and so i go back to the, the to the app but like astro twitter especially you know which is something that i'm deeply invested in like astronomy is great on twitter i mean there's so many mm -hmm. conversations that are happening even in real you know you scientists all around the world are kind of talking yeah. about yeah. things yeah you know, and it's great yeah even i, I will guess that if you if you go to my account i have a science tweets list that is just scientists on the space and planetary science so yeah yeah even even the best parts of twitter are time sucking monstrosities this but the dude next week's gonna be like fun for that next level yeah and, and now people are kind of using twitter as like you know it's an article like you know 30 parts yeah <laughs> yeah like, that i don't get <laughs> like start a like, blog nerd like, oh, man just write an article at this point you know i don't, I don't need 50 I tweets mean, <laughs> yeah thread, threaded tweets are great but people have taken them to excess it's like no okay uh, mm, yeah. oh so canadian space advocate is saying Fraser reading Twitter brought about the bad stuff for the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I started reading Twitter in 2020 and ushered in three of the, uh, of the horsemen of the apocalypse. That's how it works. It's my fault. Yeah. Possible. I was drawn Plague, like a moth war. to flame. Yeah. No, you really, wow. We really are looking mm -hmm. at the horsemen of the apocalypse. Thanks. Yeah. That's a great, great note to start my. There's like one left though. Week on. You know, it did we've got start one more. Home. It did start at Hawaii AAS because you did mm -hmm. have it on your phone to get around mm -hmm. the conference. Yep. Yep. So there you go. It's like when well, I rejoined also... Facebook and it crashed Facebook for a day. Mm. <laughs> that's a that's a real blow to Facebook. All right. Enough of this yak. Let's get on with the uh, with the show. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about uh, the impact of the Russian-Ukrainian war on all things space. Uh, we're going to be talking about a bunch of cool exoplanets uh, and then a bunch of stuff about Mars. Joining me this week, we've got Dr. Alex Tichy. Alex. Hi, Fraser. Good to be here. Happy, happy New Year! Happy New what, was, yeah. what was Happy New Year? Well, it's just a couple of a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Lunar New Year, yeah, well, yeah, was, uh, yeah, in the last few weeks, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Happy New Year, Xinian <laughs> Kuala. Awesome, Xinian Kuala. Yeah, um, we got Beth Johnson. Hey, Beth. Hey, Fraser. How's it going? <sighs> it's going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're trying new things I've... at Daily Space, so it's always a little uh, chaotic. Yeah, well, you guys have a big show coming up on Friday, right? Yes, we do. Oh. We're gonna. We're actually going to focus on the uh, Russian-Ukrainian impact of uh, yep. on space. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be really fascinating. I'm, it's gonna be interesting to see sort of you guys put all this production and research and stuff in preparation of the of the show. It's gonna be pretty exciting. Uh, we got uh, Dr. Nick Castle. Hey, Nick. Hey, Fraser. How's it going? Good, good. So uh, I've got to say, congratulations to Nick. He's joined the, uh, I guess the distinguished writers of universe today published his first article just a couple of days ago nice work i refrained from writing first post on it <laughs> first, first, really was were you hovering over the keyboard there first post first it came real close yeah. don't look at the captions for the figures too closely yeah 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 no it was good it was good you uh it was you were easy editing it was almost perfect for right out of the gate so i think this is going to be a long and uh and you know, successful relationship for both of us here. Welcome. Sounds aboard. good to me. Awesome. All right. So before we get into our special guest, I want to give a huge shout out and thanks to our good friends of the weekly space hangout crew. They're our friends, our fans, the executive producers of the show. They hang out, talk space, but also coordinate and bring in really cool special guests for us to talk to. So if you want to hang out with more cool space people, 
go to wshcrew.space. All right, let's get into this week's guest. We've got Seth Lockman. Hey, Seth. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Hey, friend. The question I always ask, who are you? What do you do? Yeah, so I'm the communications director at Blue Shift Aerospace in Brunswick, Maine. Um, and uh, my background is primarily in uh, science communication and a little bit of new media. So I uh, focus on sharing the story of what our amazing team of engineers is accomplishing. And the timing for your interview is is very good because you guys just had a pretty exciting test on what, Monday? Uh, just yesterday. So yeah, Tuesday. T Tuesday. Tuesday. We, we attempted Sunday, we attempted Monday. Uh, different different things uh, wound up cropping up, different anomalies each time. Uh, but we finally got to test last night. And uh, if, if anything, uh, the engine exceeded expectations. Yeah. Uh, so this is... Uh, a, a hybrid rocket engine, uh, so liquid oxidizer, solid fuel. You can see the uh, the igniter is going there. Is that like the first time we've had a video as one of our slides? How cool is that? Uh, for the people who are listening on a podcast, there's a rocket on the screen right now. <laughs> Imagine in your mind a rocket blasting and then stopping. Yes. And so this was, so, uh, sorry. So tell us about the rocket. Yeah. So, um, so this is a, a Marvel, the, the modular adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch. Uh, we uh, submitted two SBIR proposals concurrently. One is for captain, the other for Marvel. Right now when you time. say, sorry. So SBIR, sorry. that's NASA's small business innovative research grant. Is that right? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's a small, it's a grant from NASA, kind of like the NIAC awards but for small businesses to, to provide cool tech to NASA. Yes. Yes. And so uh, Captain didn't make it, but, but Marvel did. So we were able to develop this engine. Um, and it's a, a hybrid engine that is optimized around uh, burning a, a non-toxic, very nearly carbon neutral, bio-derived solid fuel. And so one of the big things that Blue Shift is trying to do is offset uh, carbon footprint and, and the, the various other chemical footprints of the fourth industrial revolution um, as launches go from being just a just a drop bucket on the scale of human civilization um, right. to, to something that could really have a very big environmental impact. And so what is a hybrid rocket? Yeah, so um, un unlike with cars, uh, a hybrid rocket is actually a lot simpler. Uh, you've got... Uh, basically, two different states of matter in your in your propellant. So usually, the way this is done is with a liquid oxidizer and a solid fuel. So that's that's what we did here. Um, and uh, basically, uh, this this here is a, a pressure fed system. So there's not even a, a turbo pump, which saves even more on hmm. the plumbing that you might otherwise need uh, for a for a, a liquid propellant rocket, where you have a liquid oxidizer and a liquid fuel. Um, and also, uh, one advantage of just about any hybrid rocket really, is that solid fuel tends to be incredibly stable uh, to the point that uh, in our case, there's a zero TNT value. So it might conflict in a, in a worst case scenario, but it, it won't deflagrate. Um, and so it's sort so of a little it, bit of a, it'll light on fire, but it won't explode. Uh, yeah, that's right. So there, there might be a, there might be a pressure wave. Uh, we've had, we've had one or two of those, uh, <laughs> but it, it, a, a, a catastrophic failure, a worst case scenario, does not look nearly as spectacular as uh, as what you might expect. Right, uh, we're right. seeing rockets explode uh, on on YouTube or right. something like that. And so, and so, this mix, like, like I'm sort of thinking out about traditional mm -hmm. rocket engines, right? You've got, say, the space shuttle with liquid hydrogen and oxygen, which is yep. a very complicated system. Or say the Saturn V is liquid oxygen and kerosene. Yep. Or um, but then you think of like a solid rocket. So the solid rocket boosters on the side of the space shuttle or the ones that are attached to like the Atlas and deltas and stuff to give them some additional kick. I guess they're going to be on the space launch system as well. Um, so what is, what is the challenge of, I guess, what is your oxidizer first? You use a liquid oxidizer. Is that right? Uh, that's right. So it's, yeah. uh, it's just, uh, nitrous. And then the solid is a, a proprietary mix. Right. Um, Magic. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, so what, we're, what we're trying to go for with, uh, it is, is to get a little bit of throttle ability, right? You control the oxidizer flow rate. You control the amount of thrust 
that's being produced at the back of the engine. Um, and then we get a, a very good energy density from that solid fuel. Um, so you get a little bit of the best of both worlds. The, the, yeah. Oh, well, so you kind of went into my next question there, which is mm -hmm. like the, the downside of a solid rocket booster is that once you yeah. turn it on, you don't get to turn it off until it's, it decides when, when it's over. Um, right. So with, with yours, if you stop feeding it the oxidizer, will it shut down? Yes. Yes. Huh. Uh, in fact, we're about to, to test the start stop ability of this engine um, by uh, reusing the, uh, the fuel core that we used in this test in the next test. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then I guess it, and so you're saying, explain sort of like how this simplifies, wow. like I'm imagining say the Raptor two engine, which is mm -hmm. just this great big rocket bell with just a mess of pipes and cables and, and stuff sitting on top that mm -hmm. apparently lights its own combustion chamber on fire. Um, how much simpler is a hybrid rocket compared to a liquid fueled rocket like that yeah so this is this is gonna be a little bit careful about talking over you know over getting in over my head here um sure. but basically the 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 biggest simplification is in the solid oh. there i go i was trying to isolate my microphone that's what i get for that yeah um okay so the uh, the solid fuel is uh it's just in there so no no pumps no plumbing no nothing right hmm. um and then the oxidizer uh i uh I actually don't know too terribly much about our oxidizer system. I, I didn't want to know. Okay, right. But um, but it it is e even so. We're we're still dealing with half the complexity that is inherent right. to a liquid propellant rocket. And so let's talk about the like what are the potential use cases? I mean, the carbon neutrality is pretty exciting. Yes, and uh, we also know that our rocket, uh, a, a smaller version of the engine that you just saw being tested, actually powered a, a prototype rocket in flight in January of last year. And uh, we we were in the extreme cold in the far reaches of Northern Maine. Here it is. And uh, we, we had to scrub our first launch attempt due to weather and we left the rocket sitting. Um, it was protected from wind, but basically it was, it was relentless. There was no break. And then we pulled it back out of, uh, of uh, actually an old airplane hangar and we we set it back up and and just launched it like this. And so the engine was was right at home. I was I was explaining um, before we before we started that actually the the electronics were complaining a, a little bit. Our, our server literally froze. We had to, we had to thaw our server uh, to to conduct the launch here, but right. the rocket was perfectly happy in these extremely cold conditions. Right. And so what are the you know what are some of the applications that you envision for a rocket like this? Um, so I, I suppose the, the same as any other rocket, our, our business model is first to develop sub launch services. And, uh, so we, we want to offer a uh, double what the industry standard is for your time in microgravity. We're shooting to about, uh, you know, five to eight minutes. And, uh, that would, you know, the, the, the beachhead customer, there would be like researchers, academics, hobbyists, small businesses that are trialing some sort of new technology mm -hmm. um, and, and also folks that are working up towards an orbital experiment, but they want something where they'll be able to recover the payload first. Uh, and then as uh, as we're able to get into a little bit more advanced rocketry and we're able to take that modular, the, mo the, the M in Marvel, right? We want to uh, be able to group this engine into clusters and then stages. And so once we get to uh, a two-stage design, uh, we we expect to be able to hit orbit in uh, 2024, 2025. Um, Maine, as as you may know, uh, has a pretty high latitude, mm -hmm. and it also has a south facing uh, coastline, and so it's a it's a pretty good spot to get some nice safe ocean overflight and not mm -hmm. have uh, as it's it's not a big thing, but not quite as much rotational velocity to cancel out to launch but, to polar orbits. Right. So you'd be looking for polar orbits. Yes. Yeah. And and so we'd be we'd be serving uh, small sat you know nano sat type customers um, that need access to polar low Earth orbit and five to eight minutes uh, suborbital. Right, right. Um, so then you know based on this test, mm -hmm. what does that do for your timeline? Like what comes next? Yeah. So this this test was very exciting. 
uh, it, it actually took us a, a longer to get to the test than what we than what we expected. Um, but but once we saw the engine perform, uh, that one of the big drawbacks to hybrid is stability. When you have an engine that is literally changing shape as it operates, uh, you can get issues with stability of flow, which of course in a rocket can can be catastrophic if you're not careful. So a big problem with hybrids uh, is just getting them to perform reliably at you know at all points across their operation. Um, and so the team uh, the team did it, and they they were able to solve the problem, build off of what we accomplished through that SBIR grant with NASA. And we quadrupled the diameter of the engine compared to what what flew in Stardust, like we saw mm. there. It was about ten times the the uh, maximum producible thrust. We we only uh, were doing partial power on this test uh, yesterday, um, but uh, basically we 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 were scaling up. Oh, I'm hearing myself double. Oh, Alex, you've got an echo coming from you. Oh, goodness. All right. We'll mute so yourself for now and then we'll figure this out. But yeah, we're getting a All big right. echo from you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when we turned on the engine, you know, the purpose of this test was, you know, number one, achieve ignition. Number two, achieve stable combustion. Number three, uh, get some data. We've got all kinds of sensors, way more than we've ever had on any test stand before. Um, but what we were really pleasantly surprised by is how stable the combustion was for having uh, engineered something that was, you know, four times the diameter of what we had before for a hybrid rocket engine. That's a really big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, just getting five seconds of, of stable burn, we were expecting a little bit of uh, kind of chuffing, uh, which you may have seen in hybrid rocket engine tests before. <laughs> And uh, and there was just none. So hats off to the amazing team that was able to to make that happen. Fantastic. Um, yeah. So when do we see this go orbital? Do you think? Yeah. So um, yeah, and you also have path forward. So so we're going to do somewhere between twelve and twenty four tests of this engine. Oh wow! Before okay. we, yeah, uh, and just you know dial in its operation, um, and then we produce a flight optimized version. We're going to build two suborbital launch vehicles so that uh, it, uh, if, if we lose one, we can still use the, the other one. And uh, so suborbital launch, we're, we're targeting the end of this year. Hmm. And then for orbital launch, we're looking at uh, 2024, 2025. Well, to be fair, with that test that we saw, that was already a mm -hmm. suborbital launch. He came back down, you know, it's a blessing. Oh, it was Stardust, yes. Yeah. Yes. It yeah. was... Uh, it, it was very suborbital. We, we reached about <laughs> 4,000 feet above the ground. However, we uh, we had paying customers on board. So we were demonstrating the full, you know, we have a business model. We have clients who don't even necessarily want microgravity because we only had pseudo microgravity there. There was air resistance still. Um, they wanted launch conditions. They wanted yes. to subject their, their payload to launch conditions. Um, so we were demonstrating economic demand to, to attract investors. And also, and maybe this is the right crowd to, to pose this question to. When's the last time someone flew a brand new rocket fuel? A brand new rocket fuel? Yeah. Like, uh, according, according to my dad, rocket fuel hasn't changed uh, significantly in, since uh, World War II. <laughs> right? well, I feel like Spaceship, spaceship, spaceship One used a hybrid rocket motor as well. Yes. So so maybe that was the last time a new fuel was happening. I yeah, I don't know their I don't know their formulation. They don't know yeah. their formulation. So fair yeah, you would, yeah, you you won't tell us your formulation. Um, no. So you mentioned right at the beginning that Blue Shift is employee owned. So can you yes. explain that? Uh, yeah. So uh, we use this uh, this model, and, and especially early on. So. Uh, uh, we, we worked for equity in the company through this model that we call uh, pie slices. And so many of the employees, um, and I don't know the, the exact breakdown, but many of the employees are, you know, partial owners of this pie right. that will convert to shares. Awesome. That's really yeah. smart. Cool. Well, congratulations on the recent test. And uh, please, uh, I'm sure, you know, I know you're good friends with Nancy, so definitely come back when you uh i guess when you've when you've gone orbital when you've got a next yeah, big yeah. exciting test uh let us know please 
Absolutely. I think our our next big milestone uh, toward, towards the end of these series of tests, you know, this one was just five seconds or so. We expect to be doing about 85 seconds, give or take, at full power. Um, so right. those should be pretty spectacular. Once that happens, then we have our first suborbital launch, and that should be uh, quite a quite a show. Very exciting. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming and chatting with us today. Uh, good luck with your tests, Absolutely. and uh, and I'm sure we'll be talking to you again. <laughs> thank you, Fraser. All right. Thanks, Seth. Uh, all right, Nick. I choose you. Howdy. Uh oh. Uh, let's. Let's talk about uh, Alex is is struggling with his technology. So um, so why don't we? Uh, yeah, so let's talk about oh, which one. All right, let's talk about the um, let's talk about this mineral that they found on Mars because this is this has been kind of blowing up. What is this thing? So um, exactly what the composition is uh, we don't really know yet, uh, but it's probably just a piece of um, well certainly a sulfate it's probably something like gypsum although it may be a less hydrated form than that maybe bassanite maybe anhydrite but it's a little mineral form that uh, probably grew in free water uh, back when the original bed form the original bed was forming and then got slowly covered in sediment and then when this whole valley was eroded uh, it proved to be more resistant to wind erosion than everything around it so it got left sitting on the surface wow, it's also it's... really really small right um, it's like the size of a coin like a like a penny yeah there's actually a wonderful image uh that yeah that was prepared by abigail freeman who's the deputy project scientist uh with the mission uh where she put in to scale a penny relative to this thing so it's really very small mm -hmm. um i actually love this image because it shows what we normally see as well as the cool little mineral form those two kind of spherical looking objects to the right uh, are the usual sort of concretion we see, but it's the same kind of idea, just formed through a little bit of a different process, uh, where it's huh. a little ball of some sulfate that's sitting there. Uh, the spherical-ish ones would have formed through um, either diagenesis or you know, subsequent alteration. Um, fancy geology for the rock formed, then these things happened, uh, versus this one would have formed early on uh, while the rock was still piling up as sediment. Uh, and then got softly buried and became part of the rock with time. Like, like we have some streams around me and we find concretions all the time. Yep. And, but there's usually a fossil in the middle of the concretion. And so you crack them open. They're these rock balls in the, mm -hmm. the river and they look very different. They look like sandstone, almost very different from any of the other rocks. The rest of the rocks are all like, like metamorphic rocks, but then you see yep. these weird sort of almost sandstone, almost limestone looking things. You crack them open and every time there's a fern inside or there's a fish inside or, or whatever. Yep. So clearly, you know, the it's forming around this creature, right? So I'm saying, are there Doesn't fossils have inside? To form these? <laughs> no, uh, right. there's almost certainly not a fossil inside of these. Or if there is, that would be a truly remarkable discovery. This is a neat form because it tells us for sure this would have formed in open water. And we've been going into a unit where we're looking at more and more stuff. Uh, that was, uh, the term is Aeolian deposits. These are wind-blown dunes we've been going through. But now we're transitioning towards a different feature, uh, something we call the green hue pediment, uh, which is outwashed from a stream coming from higher up on the mountain uh, that carved into a channel, or at least we think that's what it is. Well, this is some of our first evidence of water being present there as we're transitioning from one unit to another. Hmm. And so this is definitely so, something that involved water. This is definitely something that involved water. Yeah. And this was curiosity found this, right? Not perseverance. Oh, yes. This is curiosity. Yeah. We still produce news, <laughs> even though we've been there for way more than a year. Yeah. Yeah. But like... Like not like this feels like smoking gun water. Yeah, there's you actually quite a bit that has been smoking gun water throughout the course of this mission. And this isn't the first time we've seen shapes like this with Curiosity going way back to uh, mid Sol 700s. So end of the second year on Mars, uh, we were in an area called the Prompt Hills. We saw some formations 
not quite as pretty and jagged. It's actually what some of the next pictures are in my slide deck. Um, but uh, it's not unprecedented to see this. Hmm. I, yeah, so in this picture, a lot of those little kind of funky, almost fern-like looking things that are in there are these same sorts of concretions uh, that just have what we'd call a dendritic or leaf-like or tree-like shape to them. This is a zoom in of the previous image uh, that I literally just did by zooming in on it. And that's a very, very high detail image uh, taken by ChemCam uh, over a uh, long distance. It has remarkable ability to capture things up close. Now, is it just me or was the internet remarkably well behaved about this? I think we've gotten a little tired of the number of times people will say, this is definitive evidence of life. And the scientists yeah. all go, no, 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 no. Yeah. I mean, we, we posted the image on, on, on uh, SETI and definitely there are quite a few people who are like, oh, it's coral. No. Yeah. No, it's yeah. not. It's not coral. It's no. not the same kind of form. <laughs> but the usually but no, bad actors somehow didn't like the people who would warn us about an impending asteroid pass that's going to come within five times the distance of the moon didn't seem to be really jumping on board and, and calling this life. Maybe they're all distracted by other world news. Maybe, maybe, or maybe they're just finally learning and they're behaving themselves and they're not in it just for the clickbait and the rampant commercialism. Such Maybe. I absolutely treasure. love the dream there. Yeah, I really am an optimist. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> All right. Alex has uh, duct tape and bailing wire gotten his internet setup going. So, uh, but it's just a matter of time before it all comes crashing down again. So tell us, let's talk about what's happening. I mean, we try to stay out of politics, but there's a war and right. it's going to have implications for space. So, So let's talk about that. Right. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure everybody has uh, been watching the news uh, or trying to avoid it as best they can. But there's obviously a war going on in, in Ukraine and uh, this does impact space. So it's really, I think, one of the biggest news of the week. And we've, I think we've, we've got to talk about it. Obviously, the United States, along with the European Space Agency, have been uh, collab collaborating with uh, the Russian Federation uh, in the form of uh, Roscosmos. That's the sort of the Russian uh, equivalent of, of NASA. Uh, you know, this started a long time ago. Apollo Soyuz, 1975, is really the first time we had a sort of, you know, the sort of some people call it the end of the space race, where we finally started sort of uh, cooperating a little bit, and then really starting in the after the end of the Soviet Union, 1992, uh, the former Soviet Union canceled their uh, space station program. We canceled a space station program. We decided in 1993 to collaborate on the International Space Station. We've been working together ever since. And of course, also when we uh, shut down the space shuttle in 2011, uh, for many years thereafter, we were sending astronauts uh, to Russia to train and of course to hitch a ride on the Soyuz uh, spacecraft to, to go to ISS. So we've been reliant on Russia uh, for a long time. Of course, now we have uh, SpaceX Dragon um, that we are no longer reliant on Russia. But of course, we still cooperate in space. And space has been this sort of thing that's been kind of more or less untouched uh, recently, you know, where we have politics going on on the ground, but in space, uh, we continue to uh, work together. But recently, uh, just uh, obviously in the wake of these uh, events, the last several days, uh, the director general of uh, Roscosmos, his name is uh, Dmitry Rogozin, uh, he's sort of a firebrand, uh, really. Mm -hmm. He's a former uh, uh, politician. He was a deputy prime minister for the defense industry for a long time. And then he became the ambassador, the Russian ambassador to NATO. And of course, Russia doesn't have a very uh, a, a favorable view of NATO. And then in 2018, he became the head of uh, Roscosmos. And I, I couldn't help but laugh on his uh, Wikipedia page. The personal life just says he's an active user of Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> and that's all it says. And he really is a firebrand on Twitter. You can imagine if someone's kind of like a little bit of a John Bolton mixed with the mouth of a Donald Trump or a wolf yeah. warrior. Uh, diplomat from from China uh, will really just say a lot of stuff, and he had this whole tweet storm about you know what are you guys going to do if you stop cooperating with us? You know you've already deprived of of, of the sort of uh, access to certain technologies, but we've been doing fine. But uh, he makes the point that they use the Soyuz uh, 
uh, spacecraft to boost the orbit of ISS uh, periodically and also do uh, hazard maneuver, hazard avoidance maneuvers, um, and even took a shot at uh, Elon Musk indirectly with these um, uh, satellite constellations uh, that are obviously becoming a, a problem up there. Uh, didn't say anything about the uh, November destruction of a satellite uh, that, that uh, Russia was uh, responsible for. Um, but, you know, basically threatened that ISS could fall out of the sky and fall out of the sky on the heads of the U.S. or on Europe or on India or on China. China, yeah, yeah. It'll be uh, so, you know, it doesn't fly over Russia, but, it, you know, what are you going to do when this thing falls on your heads and, you, you know, you guys kind of uh, need us? Now, the thing is, is that this is not really the case. They uh, have been using the Soyuz spacecraft to boost the uh, the orbit, uh, but recently the Cygnus spacecraft has uh, is, is now tasked with this mission as well. Elon Musk also jumped in and said... Um, he just posted the... SpaceX logo in in the thread. Yeah, right, right, right. Now he's been kind of joking with them. There was back in 2014. There was another episode, the invasion of Crimea. Um, actually, Rogozin was one of seven people directly sanctioned by President Obama. His uh, foreign assets were frozen, and he was banned from coming to the United States. So it's pretty amazing that we, you know, just imagine Jim Bridenstine <laughs> being yeah. uh, in this sort of situation in reverse. Uh, and uh, he said, you know, well, how are you going to get to the ISS using trampolines? And uh, then when Dragon finally started a uh, flying crew, uh, Elon Musk uh, famously said, the trampoline is working. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. you know, so this is a sort of a, a, an interesting, interesting time, not just ISS, of course. Uh, but uh, as you mentioned in the pre-show, uh, Russia is uh, now saying that they won't uh, launch out of uh, French Guiana. And also, they are refused just in the last, uh, well, since I woke up, really, I saw this on the news. The Roscosmos is now saying that they won't launch the uh, one web satellite. Yeah. This is another internet uh, satellite constellation um, that is now a, a sort of a joint uh, private public partnership with the, the, the UK government. And he said, well, you know, for one thing, uh, you may have seen Elon Musk saying, you know, we're going to send Starlink to Ukraine. So that they can have uh, internet, uh, even you know, even if uh, the hard wire gets cut, um, and people were sort of skeptical whether that was actually going to happen, but it seems like they've actually been yep. showing with the with the hardware. Uh, and so uh, Roscosmos says, you know, you need to guarantee us that one web will only be used for civilian purposes, and also that the UK will you know revoke its uh, financial stake in um, in one web. So you know, just basically the politics is uh, at this time we're we're uh, we're touched by it as well uh it's a little reminiscent of the uh plot point from 2010 odyssey 2 which is a highly under underappreciated film the the se sequel to 2001 space odyssey where you have a joint a uh, uh, american and soviet crew on a on a mission to jupiter and then war breaks out back home and they have to kind of you know stop working together and go to their separate quarters. <laughs> so we really hope something like that doesn't happen on the ISS. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. the astronauts and the cosmonauts and alike are um, obviously, you know, deeply troubled by the events uh, back home. And up till now, we've we've been able to keep uh, politics more or less out of this, but we'll, it remains to be yeah. seen whether or not that can continue. There's been a couple of other issues as well. Um, it looks like the ExoMars mission, which was originally supposed to launch in, 20, in 2020 with Perseverance, got delayed because they were having difficulty getting the whole parachute system working. So they pushed it back mm -hmm. to 2022 and now it looks like it's going to get pushed back again. And it's a collaboration between uh, Roscosmos and the European space agency. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if the, if the Europeans have to take over and rebuild big chunks of this mission to make it all work together. Um, Pamela, you were showing the, his Twitter profile, so if people are interested um, on his Twitter profile on the right hand picture there. So that is a uh, Topol M ICBM launcher. So he changed his profile from, I don't know, some cool rocket to a nuclear mobile nuclear rocket launcher, wow. which you, you like, I guess that has something to do with space, but you know that's kind of a dick move so yeah his, his twitter is very 
uh, obviously nationalistic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. And, you know, and NASA, by the, for their part, put out this very anodyne, you know, we will continue to cooperate to the extent yep. possible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this and sort of thing. Like, but it's I'm just the, an entirely different thing over yeah, there. I'm yeah. in the nuclear weapons business now. Yeah. 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 It's very frustrating. So anyway. Right. All right. Well, thanks, Alex. I know you got to you got to run, but uh, yeah. appreciate that update. Right. Good to see you all. Take care. Good to see you, Alex. Beth, what do you got? Uh, you want me I'll to start with choose. the the hot Jupiter? Sure. I think the hot Jupiter is pretty cool here. Or, or that's hot. Cool. Yeah. So uh, WASP one twenty one B is a new um, planet that's been found, and uh, it's a hot Jupiter. It's oh, it's it's eight hundred and fifty five light years from Earth. It's about twice the size of Jupiter. Um, about twenty percent greater mass, and um, it whips around its star every thirty hours. So it's it's big. It's close and it's tidally locked. So um, one side of it is always facing its star and the other side is facing the, the coolness of, of space. And so this is creating a very interesting heat differential, which I know um, you guys talked about a bit on uh, Astronomy Cast this week, where we were talking about weird places where life could be. Um, this is probably not one of them, right? but it is a really good example of something that you talked about, which was how uh, cloud circulation can happen because of these huge temperature differentials. Um, so the day side gets to be about 3000 degrees Celsius and the That's night metal. side is, yeah, is, is half that. So it's about 1500 degrees. And what they're finding is that it's so hot on the day side that water molecules do exist, but they glow and they break apart because it is just that hot. So it becomes basically ionized hydrogen and oxygen. So hmm. then you add in the the winds that this this temperature differential creates, um, which are very swirling, very fast, and they basically take all of this hot, glowing ionic hydrogen and oxygen, and they move it around to a cooler night side where it gets to condense and come back together and become water vapor, and then lather, rinse, repeat. It it basically circulates around the hmm. planet that way. So it's too hot for water vapor, pretty much most of the time. Right. But it's it's pretty fascinating. Like now that astronomers have the ability to actually measure and test the atmospheres of these planets, that they're starting to work out these really fascinating interactions in ways that we just don't have anything like that here in the solar system. And so now you can actually see and detect these weird cycles. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not sure if this one has the iron rain, but there are some that that do. It, it it's rain is is even more interesting. So the because it doesn't it can't hold on to water clouds, right? So they they as soon as they form, they're basically whipped around and broken apart. But it is obviously a has a thick atmosphere. It's a hot Jupiter. So the things that are also in it are um, iron, magnesium, chromium, vanadium, and uh, these these do condense into clouds and they rain liquid gems. So think uh, liquid rubies and sapphires falling wow. from the sky. That's so it's, it's, it's cool. pretty, pretty neat. I, I think it's pretty amazing. And all of this is done without JWST. Yeah. You know, that was supposed wait. to be the big, we're going to, you know, figure out all of these exoplanetary atmospheres. And then it took so long. Everybody went, all right, we got to find other ways to do this. So they did, they used Hubble for this. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, Ariel's coming in 2028, mm -hmm. and that's its only job is characterize the atmospheres of, of exoplanets. So we're moving from this, we found planets, to we're understanding the atmospheres of, of planets. It's pretty exciting. And, yeah. and even though you would want to live on this world, it sure is a fascinating place to imagine a rain of gemstones. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> I know. I, That's I, a pretty awesome that, chemistry. Yeah, it is. That that really just sort of struck me is that that's just interesting and, and different. So, yeah, we've we've heard about raining diamonds, but this one's raining rubies and sapphires. Absolutely fascinating. Thanks, Bess. Mm -hmm. All right. Nick, what's this here about your other story? So my other story is thinking about what we would use for building materials off of the Earth. So usually if you think about space structures you're thinking about things like um, the giant um, steel cans that are the uh, international space station or maybe you're thinking about uh, the proposed inflatable modules uh, made out of plastic 
But turns out on the Earth, the vast majority of what we use is concrete. And it's really not practical to ship that to other worlds. It's heavy. Like, it's, it's not even really practical heavy. to pick up a bag of this stuff and put it in your car. Yeah, and it's not a very efficient use. I mean, concrete's made up of a mixture of cement or some form of binder, uh, about 10% of it. 80% of it is crushed up rock, or if you want to use the industry term, aggregate. And the remaining 10% is water, which helps which activate the binder, heavy. spread it around, and do the chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all if you're looking of those at things what are heavy. You, all of those things are heavy. Well, fortunately, we don't have to bring the aggregate with us. You know, turns out planets are made of rocks, unless they're made of gas, in which case, good luck building the structure. <laughs> water, we found, is available all over the solar system. It's remarkable how many places we found water, including on Mercury. So you might be able to find water in place if you're clever about how you set up where you'd want to build your settlement or your outpost or whatever it is you're building. The question is, what do you do for a binder? And people have been bouncing ideas for this for a long while now. Um, and I've read some conference proceedings back in uh, from back in the 80s and 90s where they're looking at, well, could we make bricks on the moon? You know, just scoop up some of the regolith, press it all together and see if it sticks. And the answer is maybe, but then what? Because if you have bricks, that's half of brick and mortar. You're still missing the mortar. Um, so one idea is you could melt uh, regolith on whatever world you're on, and you can make what's called a sintered brick. It's where you melt the outside, and that melted rock starts to percolate inside and form a structure that gives it some strength. But then sticking those bricks together without anything more than just I'm melting more rock to stick them together is really hard. You either need a specialized machine that's going to melt it in place and stick it together and make whatever structure you're building, or you need an astronaut to carry a brick that's been heated to like 1400 Celsius. Good luck. Other options, I mean, on the Earth, most of what we use comes out of limestone. Ultimately, it's carbonates. Um, we actually do some more chemistry to it. We mix it with uh, clay minerals and we bake it and we make uh, something called lime and it's a whole process. But the fundamental part we need from that is the limestone, the calcium carbonate. That isn't really common outside of the earth, at least not in large deposits. There might be carbonate volcanoes elsewhere in the solar system, but we haven't found them yet. Like, isn't it, isn't carbonate just made by life? Mm -hmm. Not exclusively. Carbonate. But right. primarily. Yeah. Yeah. Calcium carbonate primarily is, is made from life. It, it's almost all seashells. If you look up a geology 101 textbook, it is seashells. Uh, if yeah. you open up the graduate version of the textbook, okay, there's some freakish volcanoes and we don't know as much as we want to. And right. But it's mostly seashells. Another binder uh, would be phosphates. But again, we run into a problem. All of the deposits of phosphates we know of that are substantial in size are made up of fish skeletons. <laughs> it turns out the rest of the solar system is surprisingly lacking in fish. So what are you going to do for phosphates? I mean, that we you can know get of. little appetites, yeah. but they're tiny little grains mixed up in um, igneous rocks. So good luck, because you need volumetrically significant amounts of this stuff. You can also look at things like plastics. And maybe if you have a good chemical process going on something like Mars, you can turn the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere into plastics. It requires a lot of water and a ton of power. Mm -hmm. But you might be able to do it. But that doesn't help the moon much. And it's really hard to do. Well, some researchers have started to come up with some other suggestions for this. For example, looking at magnesium oxides. Magnesium is a common component of, well, everything. So it's floating around. If you can break it apart and combine it with uh, silica, that is silicon oxide, uh, you can actually do some of the same reactions uh, hmm. that we talk about for normal concrete, but with magnesium instead of with carbonate. And it's uh, and very so, common on the moon, right? Like, like you've got yep. like silicon, iron, aluminum, and then I think magnesium is the next most common metal on the moon. Then the next ones are calcium and sodium and so on and so forth. Yeah. It's a really common component of a lot of minerals that are common on planetary surfaces. Olivine and pyroxene are basically what you're looking to pull apart for that. Hmm. What's so, the process like? Do you know what you have to do? 
of them? It's some fun chemistry because you're really talking about breaking the mineral apart into its base elements. Uh, and there's some creative chemistry that some researchers have figured out to really start to minimize the amount of energy you have to pull in. So it's not literally break it down to every single independent element. Uh, there's some clever tricks you can do with that. I don't think we should spend the time to go into that in great detail right now. Yep. Yep. Um, but yeah, uh, you can start to find ways to pull that apart. And there are researchers actively pursuing how would we do that? And at the same time, if we did that, how good is the material we make? Uh, some results that uh, I've seen flying around from conference proceedings I looked into on this. Um, it looks like we're getting things that are actually pretty comparable to normal earth based concrete which is great because that's the kind of strengths you want for pressurized habitat, whether you're on the moon or Mars. I mean, that's the cool really part cool. in that construction is the difference between on Earth, you're trying to keep the atmosphere from crushing your building. On Mars, you're trying to keep it from exploding your building. <laughs> right. Um, cool. So do you think, you know, like, like, I know you're you're re doing all this kind of research. Do you think that we'll get to a point with purely power and a shovel? We'll have everything we need to make I concrete. I really, on Mars? really hope so. Yeah, because that's the kind of stuff that we need if we ever want anything that's off of the Earth to be self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. If there is one thing you're missing that you have to ship in from the Earth, can't be self-sustaining. Yeah, you have to rely upon that stream coming in from the Earth. So this is true for agriculture, it's true for building materials, it's true for everything. So now, the closer you... we get to identifying what are our critical needs and how do we meet them in place, the better the prospects of actually doing what companies like SpaceX have said they're going to do. Now, have you seen the the story about the them trying to make concrete on the International Space Station? So they've, they've Honestly, there's actually an ex yeah, there's an experiment there right now where they're mm -hmm. they're trying to just see what happens to concrete in microgravity which they're they are doing exactly what you said they're shipping up all the parts and they're mixing it in a bag and then they're actually making little concrete shapes in space well if you think about it there isn't a whole lot of other choices on the space station because what are they going to mine the soyuz capsule yeah yeah exactly um, yeah so please don't yeah but yeah, yeah. but it, but you and can that's see the fascinating that... question too is how does cement cure right. when it's in microgravity i mean Easy. we're used to thinking about it as it's essentially a dewatering process you remove water from the cement uh, to solidify your concrete and make the solid structure with its strength well, what if there's no gravity does it still yeah. diffuse to the outside or does it stay there yeah yeah so this is what the experiment is and so there's they're running the test right now be interesting to see how it turns out very cool all right we're almost running out of time so i want to get to get to beth now um let's talk about your uh tattooing <laughs> okay so this is a planet we already knew about so this is is kepler um 16b it was discovered way back in 2010 so this is not a new planetary detection what this is however is basically a proof of concept because they used the 193 centimeter at the Observatoire de Haute Provence in France to the uh, velocity method to detect the plant, this planet that is going around two stars. And that is sort of it, the new thing is using this particular method in this manner from the ground and getting a circumbinary planet and actually confirming that yes, we can find this planet we know is there. So that's a big deal because it means they can now use this same method to do more of this and find more of these planets. So, you know, freeing up a little bit of, of time to go through, you know, making the confirmations is always the difficult part. So now they can go through some of the Kepler and test data and actually assist in, in trying to find these particular types of planets. So did they, they knew that there was a planet there, but they didn't know it was a binary system? No, no, no. This is the original Tatooine discovery. This is the one that made the news in 2010. Right. It was okay, like, look, okay. we found a planet and it's got yeah, two suns. It's, it's and it's Tatooine. Cool. Yeah. 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 So this when when they say it's Tatooine, it really is that first one that, that really, yeah. you know, made the news cycle. And so all they were trying to prove is that they could find it with their telescope from the ground using radial velocity, which, of course, is a little bit trickier because you have two stars and one planet. 
And so you have to be able to measure the gravitational tugs going on and mm -hmm. you've got one extra thing to sort of fight with in there. And they did it. So they've, it was, like I said, it was a proof of concept to take a known exoplanet or, you know, in a binary system and, and show that, yeah, we can, we can actually use our data to find it too. Right. So confirming that you can, you can see this planet with the radio velocity method. And I guess, I mean, the great thing about the radio velocity method is that gives you the, um, gives you the mass. Mm -hmm. And while the transit method with Kepler gives you the size and the, the orbital period. Mm -hmm. And so with those two, you and, and of, of course for, you know for Kepler, you know, the, the light curve is very dependent on the angle between you and, and the planet and the star and the radio velocity method, you have a little bit more leeway in what you can detect. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. Mm -hmm. All right. We've reached the end of our hour. So Beth, uh, tell us what you're working on and where people can find out more. Uh, working on, um, transitioning into some new daily space methods for presenting. So we've brought back, um, Annie as our producer and we're kind of, in the technological nightmare that is getting all of that set up. So um, it's it's challenging and every day is a learning curve, but it's going to be for the best and we're really excited about it. And uh, I think her debut will actually be that special episode on Friday um, where we're going to take a, an extended look at the um, Russian-Ukrainian uh, conflict and um, its impact on space science and space exploration. Really cool. Like I said, it's kind of exciting. You guys are are gearing up doing all this pre-production and research for this episode. So I'm looking forward to watching it. Uh, and if people want to find out more about what you're working on, where should they go? Uh, for daily space, you want to go to at Cosmoquest X uh, pretty much everywhere. And for me, I'm at Planetary Pan. Perfect. Nick, what are you working on? Oh, I think Nick froze. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's just me now. <laughs> oh, well. Um, uh, Alex Tichy, he had to leave, but you should definitely follow Alex on Twitter and follow his, his work and the rest of his team. Nick, I don't know if he's on. His, he's, he Twitter. has a Twitter. It's there at Planetary. There he is. Yeah. Nick's back. Got you back? Hold on. It's different Nick. Other Nick. They can hear you though. There we I go. Have right. returned. Nick, what are you working on and where can people find out more? So I was actually just accepted into the uh, American Geophysical Union's Voices for Science program, which is learning to be a better science communicator. So what I'm working on is upping my social media game and starting to you know, widen my engagement with that. Uh, you can find out more when I get around to updating it because I'm still the wandering scientist, just not very good at it. All right. Well, well pro tip, that's all a lie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> being highly engaged on Twitter is, uh, is, is not the, the best use of your time for becoming an effective science communicator. The best use of your time is honing your craft by writing more articles on Universe Today. I was I wondering if you were going to bring that up. I, yeah. I knew that was coming. Yeah, yeah. That I was just thinking the first you... article took a month. The second yep. one will take a week. Exactly. Then yeah, we're we're yeah moving. When the you're trend at down two hours, hourly. then you know you're you're really rocking and rolling, and uh, <laughs> and we will we will hone you into a science communication weapon. No question. So sounds like fun. Yeah, awesome. Uh, and then and then you can just let the whole Twitter nonsense just be this. Thing you don't have to pay any attention to i guarantee it it worked for that, me that until over there that tells me what to write about yeah yeah exactly until it worked for me until 2020 so 20 years of ignoring social media worked just fine so don't worry about well, it. really only a decade of ignoring social media <laughs> true yeah well I'm ignoring my space I, I i ignored my space that's yeah, fair that's yeah, fair exactly and, and i ignored aol perfect yeah yeah all right. So uh, I, I mentioned this on Monday, but if you didn't catch my live show, uh, 
the new NASA's NIAC Awards, the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Awards are out. And I have just gone and invited everybody to be interviewed. So I reached out to pretty much every single person who received a NIAC grant and they're all, <laughs> they're all coming to roost. So, um, and I've got a bunch of other interviews as well. So I'm going to have a ton of interviews. So tomorrow I got an interview with Matthew Campbell about solar sales on Friday. I'm interviewing John Nobel prize winner, John Mather, which is going to be exciting. And then on Monday morning, I've got Alina Dongia and then about another eight interviews are sort of coming in for landings. So my next couple of weeks are going to be incredibly interview heavy, but they're all going to be super interesting. So stay tuned for that. And where, where can people find you, Fraser? Universe Today on all the things. Thanks for asking, Beth. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everyone, for watching us today. Thanks to our special guest. Thanks to Alex, who had to leave, and, the, and my other co-hosts. Thanks to everyone watching us, both on YouTube and on Twitch. Thanks to all the moderators for keeping us organized. Thanks to Nancy Graziano for hurting all the cats. And thanks to Pamela for engineering, doing all of the behind the scenes wizardry. We couldn't do this without you guys. And we will see all of you next week. Thanks everyone. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.